Most of us don't plan for our deaths. Only 40% of adults have a will. Tonight on The Best Times, we'll tell you about six legal documents you need. For most people, driving is a necessity, but what happens when aging slows us down? Tonight, we'll talk about hanging up the keys. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. Planning for the end of life is not a topic that most of us want to discuss, and so we often put off executing the important legal documents that we should have as we get older. That's why only four out of 10 adults have a will. Nearly two thirds don't have an advanced directive or a living will. And half of adults 50 plus don't have a durable power of attorney. Not having these documents can put your finances and your health at risk, and it can create a potential nightmare for your heirs. Tonight on The Best Times, we talk with a legal professional about the six legal documents you need as you get older. We have several documents to talk about, but let's start with the one I think most everyone is familiar with, at least to some degree, a will. Uh, even though they're familiar with it, uh, about half of Americans don't have one. They haven't taken the time to make one. Why should everyone have a will? And that's an amazing statistic that only 50% of Americans have a, a last will and testament. Well, they, I, we should all have a, have a will because in that document we get to set out who would receive our property in case of our death. Now, the, many times through the years I've met with people that may have been separated for long periods of time from their spouse, or maybe they're even in divorce proceedings where they have children that are not part of their lives and they prefer not to include them. But without a will, they do not get to choose who they leave their property to. Because the fact is, if you have not written a will, the state of Tennessee or your home state has a will for you, and it may not be what you want it to be. So for example, in Tennessee, if you die without a will, your property will be left to your to your spouse and to your children. Now, also in Tennessee, you must include your spouse and your dependent children. But let's say that you have a 29-year-old child that's been estranged from you for several years and you choose not to include them. You don't have to. In the, in the will, you would only acknowledge that you had that child, but you do not have to leave them one dollar or, or one cent. So that's the only way to really communicate your wishes. That's exactly now, right. Now, I know there are people out there, viewers out there, that are saying to themselves, well, I just, I'm not a wealthy person. I have a very modest estate. Why do I need to will? Well, if you have an estate, let's say it's of $10,000. Better yet, let's say your only asset might be a life insurance policy that you have through your employer. You need to have a beneficiary named, or it may be a, the last will and testament as well to set out who those beneficiaries would be. Think about this too, if one of your beneficiaries is a minor, then that means a guardianship would be in place, but through a will you can establish a trust for that minor beneficiary or that disabled beneficiary so that they could still receive benefits through Medicaid or, or TennCare. So that even if it's a more modest amount, you still need to set that out so your wishes are known, so your voice is heard even after you're passing. Now let's talk about another document that I'm not that familiar with, but I do know enough that it is similar to a will, but you say it's better. It's called a revocable living trust. That's a mouthful. I don't even know what a trust is. Tell me. Well, a trust is an instrument where you, that you create that would become the owner of your assets during your lifetime. Now, a revocable living trust means just that. You create this trust, 
But you, you as the grantor, the person creating the trust, you also serve as your own trustee. So really, everything is still the same as it was yesterday, but today going forward, you sign your name, comma, trustee. But you have full control over all those assets. The magic of that document, though, one of the, one of the pieces of magic is after your death, your successor trustee picks it up and is able to administer your estate without having to go to court, without having to pay a surety bond, give notice to creditors, do all of those go things. Go through the probate process. Exactly, the, the probate process is avoided. Probate, I don't know if you realize this, but in, in the state of Tennessee, an attorney and the also the executor can be paid up to 5% of the value of the probate assets. Now that, that's a pretty hefty amount, so on a, let's say a $500,000 estate, that's $50,000 that could walk away potentially just in legal fees. Now with the trust, if you take the time and you move your assets, move ownership of the assets into the trust, at the time of your death, your successor trustee, whoever that is, is able to administer the trust. And there've been many times when I've spoken to these successor trustees and they just can't believe how easy it is. And they may be able to administer the estate if it's simple. You know, if everything is in bank accounts, for example, it's just a matter of a few hours and virtually no time with the attorney. Maybe it's one hour, two hours with the attorney, but it can just be so simple and easy. Let's talk about two more documents, both uh, power of attorney documents, one for right. financial matters, one for health care. First off, what's a power of attorney? Why do I need one? Well, I believe for all of us, if we're 18 years of age or older, we need to have powers of attorney because it is our, that is our voice to be heard of who would handle our affairs if we lose mental capacity. If we become mentally incapacitated, who would I appoint to handle my financial concerns or my medical concerns? You know, for example, I may have two children that one is wonderful with money, but may live far away. But then I may have a, another child that lives closer to me that cannot ba balance his or her own checkbook. So I would appoint the one that has the medical background to make my medical decisions and my child that lives further away to handle finances. Now what happens if I don't have that? that that's, that's really what you want to know, which is they, my kids may have to go to court and file for conservatorship, then they could argue over who has control of the funds and who makes medical decisions. Now, if there's two attorneys involved, but somebody has to, one family member hires the attorney, guess what, the court is going to appoint another attorney to act as the guardian ad litem. So now you have two attorneys on the payroll. Now, if the second child disagrees with the first, then there's three attorneys involved. And, it, and I'm gonna end up paying for all of it. And I could have avoided all of that with two simple documents. Does it have to be just one person you name in a document or can it be more than one? It could be a power of attorney. Oh, it can be more than one. It, you can certainly name more than one. Of course, my personal belief is if you have more than one person, you know, the, the number of opinions explodes. Two people yeah. will have three opinions, three people will have six opinions and, and so forth. However, in the documents, you can appoint multiple people to act as with power of attorney, especially for medical purposes, because not everyone can be there every moment that you're in the hospital. And in fact, uh, as we'll talk about, hospitals often will say, Here, here's a power of attorney form. If you don't have one, we suggest you fill it out. Right, and yeah. it's, it's a good idea to have one. Well, speaking in, in that frame, uh, let's talk about uh, advanced directives or living wills. Explain what that is and why people should have it because only uh, two out of three Americans, two out of three Americans rather, don't have the, a living will. Why do we need to have one? Well, the living will is our final expression of how, of what medical treatment we would like to receive if we're no longer able to speak for ourselves. It, and specifically, in in that point in time when we have a terminal illness and we are in a permanent vegetative state or a permanent comatose state. Now, if, uh, I've been doing this work for many years. The primary benefit that I see from it is my beneficiaries, my loved ones don't have to struggle over the decision of whether or not to ask the doctors and ask the hospital to remove resuscitative measures or, uh, or a ventilator or even you know, a, a feeding tube or a liquid IV and and antibiotics from me. They don't have to struggle with that because they already know how I feel and that they are really there just carrying out my wishes. Because, of course, the medical professionals, they are subscribed to the Hippocratic Oath. They are bound to protect life, correct? That, that, and they that, will take any procedure 
uh, that they can to do so unless you have a document like that that outlines the limits that you want to put on their care. Well, that's right. And, and so if it's important for someone to have a meaningful life or what, what's, what they see as a meaningful life, what standard of care, what, how much care do they need, then the living will can be very important. Let's talk about the last one, the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Uh, that's a mouthful. And even though I've read about it, I must admit I don't understand a lot of it. So exactly what is that? Well, let me give you some background first. Today, in our greater market here, nursing homes can cost as much as $15,000 per month. In order to qualify for Medicaid, someone in the state of Tennessee has to be down to their last $2,000 of countable assets, and their income cannot exceed about $2,200 a month. Well, if their assets exceed that, then they won't qualify unless they spend down their, their assets at possibly eleven, twelve, or fifteen thousand dollars per month. However, uh, if someone has long-term care insurance, they can help pay a, a large part of that. Most people don't. By the most way. people don't, though. And most of the time, when people think about it, they're fifty plus years of age. And at that point, the the cost is so large that they they say, you know, I'm, I'm going to roll the dice and and hope that I don't need that. And I will. Let me interject at this point because I've had this question many times. I just want to remind people that. Medicare does not pay for long-term care. Correct. Medicare is hospital insurance. It's That's medical it insurance. Is. Yeah. Well, now, I'll let you get back to explaining. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just wanted to interject that. But with the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, the Medicaid has a five-year look-back period on any gifts. I've talked to many people through the years that have said, you know what, I ha my only asset is my house, where I have a house in X amount of dollars. I want to give my house to my children. So how is your health? Well, the, I'm, you know, the, it seems like they might be in the last five years of their life or that they may need a nursing home care you know, sooner than five years. It's almost too late to do that. There's still some things we can do, there, there are. But if for someone that's thinking ahead, if someone's thinking ahead, then we can create that Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, which is a irrevocable trust. Now, that, here's a key point. You must trust your trustee. You must I trust- I guess you would if it's irrevocable. Right, that, that's right. But after five years and one day, Medicaid or TennCare in the state of Tennessee cannot, cannot count one item in that trust as belonging to you and hold that against you for that $2,000 limit. So am I interpreting this right? In other words, you are turning all over your assets to the trustee, that person you name, and they are actually in charge of all of your assets. Is that correct? That is correct. And this is all to help avoid uh, the enormous expenditures uh, and have Medicaid pay for that long-term care. That's right. Now, most people that, that do this will not put all of their assets into it. They'll put a large portion of it into, a large portion of their assets into the trust, but not every last okay. penny that they have. But the, the purpose, someone that does this is really looking forward to the future and saying, I really want to leave as much as I can to my children and grandchildren or to my intended beneficiaries that may be the charity of their choice. So in a way, it is an alternative to obviously a long-term care insurance policy, which as we said earlier, not many people have, and it is, it is rather expensive. That's right. All right. Now we talked about six documents here. Uh, after you fill them out, what do you do with them? Uh, where do you need to keep copies? Who needs to have copies? Uh, who should know in your family that you have documents one, two, three, four, five? Right, well most likely if you do have a trust or, or even a last will and testament, the person that you would appoint to be in charge is most likely the same person you would appoint with your financial power of attorney. So I, I would say give copies to that person so that they know where they have copies of the documents where they also know where you, you kept the originals. Now, I would keep the originals in, in either a safe deposit box at a, at a financial institution or at a home safe. Your attorney will retain copies as well. I don't know that I would give copies of documents to everybody in the family, but to the most trusted people. <laughs> well, Anthony, thank you very much for your advice. So now we know what documents we need as we age. Thank you, Chris. For more information about these legal documents and more, go to the website of the National Institute on Aging and search for the term legal documents. Since we were teenagers, driving has represented independence. 
we have the freedom to get in our car whenever we want and go wherever we want. Most of us would consider our car as an indispensable part of modern life. But what happens when aging begins to have a negative effect on our driving skills? How can we know when it's time to quit? How can adult children tell their aging parents that they're not safe behind the wheel? And how can we have the conversation about hanging up the keys? Ken, we know that aging is something we can't avoid, and we certainly don't want to stop driving. But how does aging affect driving? There are a number of ways that aging affects driving. If you think about it, Chris, you've got uh, seniors who uh, are dealing with, with more chronic conditions than they did when they were younger. So their reaction time, their response time is slower. You've got memory issues. Uh, that come into play with driving all the time. Mm -hmm. There's not probably a week or two that goes by you don't see a, a news story of a senior who drives off and is lost. And memory issues can be as something as simple as, and this sounds simple, but it can cause a lot of problems, forgetting the difference between the brake and the gas pedal. Which one is which, for go? Which, which seems so, I mean, that would seem to be ingrained in you, but it is a problem. It Absolutely is a problem. a problem, and that has to do with memory. And thinking about physical issues and things like arthritis, you know, when, when you and I learned to drive, we, we were told to look behind us in a couple of ways. Number one, through those mirrors, but also which way are you supposed to turn? You're supposed to turn to the right and look back over your right shoulder. If you're 87 years old, it's not likely that you're going to be able to do that not an easy with thing a lot to of do. ease. No. What about medications? Because we're talking about health-related issues. As we age, we've got to take medications for all the various problems. That plays a role, too. Absolutely. And, and what we do in, in, in our business in taking care of seniors at home, we see the effects of medication management being one of the most critical aspects of senior safety altogether, not just driving. Let's take, for instance, that, um, that 70, 80-year-old person that, that um, has 10 or more medications. It's not easy knowing what you're taking let alone knowing when to take it and making sure you're taking everything and taking everything properly. Because if you don't, things like dizziness and, and sleepiness and things that will occur potentially while you're driving. So it's a huge potential factor mm -hmm. for unsafe driving. Now there have got to be warning signs. So let's talk about those warning signs. You've put together a list of 10 warning signs. So let's talk about a, a few of them. I think one of the most common ones that families can look for and their senior loved ones are those mysterious dents uh, mm -hmm. on, on grandma's car or dad's car. Um, oftentimes um, the senior will know how they got there. Sometimes they may not know how they got there. But it's most likely uh, times when they've caused something to happen, when they've backed into something or pulled into something forward that can be a result of any of the things we just talked about, any of the physical limitations that they might have, which are natural things that happen when you grow older. Some of these things, these warning signs that th there are 10, some of them are more obvious than others. I would recommend families drive with their senior loved ones to notice things like this. For instance, things like riding the brake. How many times have you been behind a vehicle and the brake lights are on constantly? It's not necessarily because they're confused about brake and gas, but if you think about it, if you're unsure about your ability to react quickly, it's very likely you're going to have one foot on the gas pedal and one foot on the brake. You can respond more quickly. Driving too slow or driving too fast is a common sign of seniors who are unsafe at driving. But there should be a family involved in that. There should be somebody talking to her about the fact that perhaps she's an unsafe driver. We'll get to that talk in a minute because I imagine it's a difficult one. But before that, I want to talk about what is almost the essence of driving. It's the thing that we feel when we're 15 or 16 years old and we get our license, the independence of driving. I mean, when it comes down to it, isn't that the major roadblock, the major barrier to even having a discussion about hanging up the keys? Absolutely. So, so a North American survey of 70 plus year old drivers 
showed us that 90% of those people rely on driving for their independence. They're not any different than you and I, Chris, when we turned 16 and we relied on our car. If somebody would have told you when you were 21 years old, oh, you got to give up the keys, how would you feel? It's all about independence, and driving is a key part of their independence. So if you identify these symptoms, these uh, warning signs, if you see them, uh, and you're a family member or a friend, how do you go about starting to have the conversation? The right approach might be a conversation where you start at something like, Dad, I noticed something. I noticed a dent on your car. Can we be honest? Can we talk a little bit about your safety and the safety of those around you? So I think having the conversation in a positive manner and listening, because it goes back to independence. If a senior is told that they can't drive anymore, that's their independence. Mm -hmm. So be conscious of what their concerns are. They very likely are going to be angry. They're going to be anxious. It can cause loneliness because they're thinking, I'm not going to get to do what I was doing. Address those concerns and most importantly, have a plan. Don't start talking to your senior unless you have a plan. And that plan should include alternatives to getting them to places. Let's talk about quitting driving in stages because uh, seniors can do things. There's no point in them driving when they don't feel comfortable like rush hour, for example. Why drive during rush hour if you're a retired senior, right? Sure, yeah, that's a, that's a great example. And so, so some people watching this may be thinking, well, how am I gonna talk to mom or dad about taking the keys away? That may not be the answer right now. The answer may be restricting driving during certain times. And you brought up a great one, nighttime. I worked with a lady for years, a senior lady. She drove fine in the daytime, but it, at five o'clock in the winter time and at eight o'clock in the summertime, she and her husband were at home and they never got out because they knew when it gets dark, neither one of them could see very well and they weren't gonna be safe drivers. Things like uh, weather. If a, if a storm is coming, uh, mom, please don't plan to drive. Let's look at maybe having somebody else drive you. Rush hour traffic. Let's don't plan on you driving during rush hour traffic, mom. Or the highway. Let's, why don't we stay off of 240 and let's just stay mm -hmm. on the, uh, the, the smaller, let's stay off of Poplar as well because those <laughs> lanes are about this wide, right? Yeah. Let's talk about some of the smart technology that's built into modern cars because some of it can be a real help to keep older drivers behind the wheel. It sure can. I mean, most of the new cars now have the backup cameras. Uh, mine has that and it saved me a lot because if you think about it, uh, when we were young, when we taken our driver's test and for years, we were taught to look behind us. You got to look in the mirrors, but you also turn this way. So if, if you're a senior, you may not have quite a, an easy time turning to look behind you. So you've got, you've got the cameras, you've got devices that tell you if you're crossing a lane or if you're too close to another car. Um, there's, there's great technology out there for safety, like the OnStar, the GPS devices that help you find your way back home. So there's a lot of good stuff out there. But you have to master that, correct? You sort of have to be yeah. a master, and certainly not everybody can afford a new car with all that technology either. True, so, that, so that's not always the answer. Right. But conversations to, to discuss these things oftentimes are the answer. You know, I found it surprising in your survey that nearly half of the people surveyed who had had their keys taken away and had stopped driving said that it really didn't make a difference. It didn't affect their lives uh, substantially, which I found to be amazing. What then are the alternatives that a family member or a friend should put forward as how mom or dad's gonna get from point A to point B? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the question. And so I think the answers are, again, when you're talking to a loved one, have that plan. Talk to family members, church members, friends who are able to step in and help a senior remain independent by going to places. That's what we do at home instead. We provide caregivers in the home that do a lot of things, including transportation. So uh, have a plan and have plenty of alternatives before you have that conversation. Because if you have the conversation and you don't have a plan and alternatives, it will very potentially be a negative conversation. And I guess until we have uh, self-driving cars, we all have them, uh, this is going to continue to be a problem, isn't it? I think this has been a problem since Henry Ford was around, and it'll probably be a problem un uh, until cars stop running. Well, Ken, thank you for being on The Best Times with this great advice about how to uh, keep the keys or how to take them away. Thanks, Ken.
Thank you. For more advice on when and how to hang up the car keys, go to caregiverstress.com and click on the Let's Talk About Driving banner. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at wkno.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.